hosted a panel discussion on the death penalty that included two members of the organization Murder Victims Families for Reconciliation, two women whose lives had been irrevocably altered by acts of violence, who spoke of the healing power of forgiveness and reconciliation. Two years ago, we sponsored a screening of the award-winning documentary, The Trials of Daryl Hunt, about a man wrongly convicted of a brutal crime who served nearly two decades in prison before being exonerated by DNA evidence. And we were fortunate enough to have Daryl Hunt himself here with us on that night to talk about his experience. And last spring, we hosted a visit by Kirk Bloodsworth, the first person in this country to be released from death row on the basis of DNA evidence. However, the possibility of wrongful conviction is only one of the considerations that should enter into a serious reflection on the moral and legal status of capital punishment. Tonight's panelists will present a variety of insights and perspectives, which I invite you to take up as you examine this issue both with your mind and in your heart. Just a tiny bit of background. Many of you will already know that Kansas is one of 33 states that currently have the death penalty. Interestingly, the death penalty was first abolished in Kansas on January 30th, 1907. It was reinstated in 1935, but that law was voided by a 1972 U.S. Supreme Court decision. Kansas's current law was passed in 1994. To date, no one has been executed under that law. However, lest you think this is a purely academic debate, it is entirely possible that the death penalty law in Kansas will be changed this year. Senate Bill 257, which among other things would make the appeals process more restrictive, has been proposed, as has Senate Bill 126, which would abolish the death penalty. And I'm pretty sure we'll hear more about these and other legislative issues tonight. First, though, it is my honor to introduce tonight's panelists and briefly explain the format of our program. We'll begin with each panelist having 10 to 15 minutes to present their perspective on this issue. The first to speak, directly to my left, will be Joshua Papstorff. Dr. Papstorff is Associate Professor of Theology here at Newman University, as well as President of the Faculty Senate. I might add that despite his youthful appearance, he is already well on his way to attaining the honorable status of curmudgeon, so I advise you to address your questions to him with care. Our next speaker will be Michael Berzer. Dr. Berzer is a professor of criminal justice and director of the School of Community Affairs at Wichita State University. Professor Berzer has published over 40 scholarly journal articles and has authored or co-authored nine books on a variety of criminal justice subjects, and he has testified before the Kansas Judiciary Committee about ending capital punishment in the state of Kansas. Prior to his entry into academia in 1999, he served over 18 years with the Sedgwick County Sheriff's Department, where he rose to the rank of lieutenant. Uh, having just met Professor Berzer tonight, I'm afraid I can't speak to his curmudgeonly status, but he seems like a friendly enough guy. Our third panelist is Carolyn McGinn. Since 2005, Senator McGinn has represented the 31st District in the Kansas State Senate. Prior to her election as a senator, she served as Sedgwick County Commissioner from 1998 to 2004. Senator McGinn serves on several legislative committees, including the Natural Resources Committee and the Energy and Environment Joint Committees, uh, both of which she chairs, and the Ways and Means Committee, of which she is currently vice chair. So, uh, as I say, each of the panelists will have about 15 minutes to speak, and following those remarks, we will open the floor for questions. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, you to stand if you have a question, and um, please keep your questions brief and to the point, and indicate which of the panelists uh, your question is directed to. Uh, and then if the panelists would repeat the question uh, with the microphone so that everyone can hear, that would be appreciated and uh, we'll uh, plan to adjourn around 8.30 uh, tonight. 
All right, so without further ado, um, please join me in welcoming our panel of distinguished guests. maybe in a slightly different way than, than some of you would come at the issue. Um, and so, really what I want to do in, in this ever briefer time uh, is to, to do three things. Um, first off, I want to talk about what I see uh, as a real tension for many Catholics and other Christians who are coming to this issue, um, where we see uh, many passages in the Bible or in tradition for Catholics where uh, there seems to be support for capital punishment. Uh, and then on the other hand, we hear the bishops and popes telling us to work against it. So uh, if that's not a problem, I think it's at least a tension that we need to look at. Um, secondly, I then want to talk a little bit about why is it that uh, the popes and the bishops have in recent years called for an end to the use of the death penalty, uh, and to explain kind of what's behind uh, that development in the church's teaching. Uh, and then lastly, again, as, as sort of a right wing nut job, or at least former one, uh, I want to talk about using um, those understandings, how we might more effectively address many Catholics and Christians uh, in our communities, in our state, in our country, who still support capital punishment. Uh, how can we most effectively convince them uh, that it's most consistent with Catholic principles to, in fact, oppose the use of the death penalty uh, in the United States? Uh, so hopefully I can do those things here. We'll see. All right, so first off, what am I talking about in terms of attention? Um, well, when I come at this issue, um, I, I do see attention there. Uh, on the one hand, when we look in scripture, um, there are many passages where capital punishment is um, seems to be approved of and even prescribed. Um, this ranges all the way from God's uh, discussion with Noah, where he says, whoever sheds a man's blood by a man shall his blood be shed, all the way up to the New Testament read in Romans of Paul's famous uh, quote about the state not bearing the sword in vain. Now I know that there are many debates about all of those passages, uh, but for me at least it, it is a real issue, right? There seems to be a lot of passages that support the use of capital punishment uh, really throughout the biblical canon. Um, in addition to that, my own area of expertise is in historical theology, so I study church tradition. Uh, and if you look at the teaching of the church from bishops and theologians, really from the early church fathers up until the 20th century, uh, again, the teaching is fairly consistently affirming at least the validity uh, of the use of capital punishment in some cases, stretching from Augustine up to at least Pius XII. Um, so again, as, as a fairly conservative Catholic who's committed to affirming tradition, uh, this does seem to create, um, to create a tension. Um, obviously, where does the tension come in? Well, when we look at more recent church teaching, uh, there's a difference, right? And so, again, time is brief, um, but as you probably all know, at least the most three recent pontiffs have all publicly declared that they believe the penalty ought no longer 
So John Paul II very famously in Evangelium Vitae in 1995 called for this. And that's been echoed by both uh, Pope Benedict XVI and by Pope Francis recently. Um, so what's going on here, right? None of these men are what you would think of as theological radicals. Now Francis has raised a few eyebrows. <laughs> uh, but I, I still think theologically underneath it all, there's quite a bit of continuity with the tradition. Um, and certainly Benedict uh, and John Paul II are not theological radicals. So why are they saying this? When we have this in scripture, we have this in tradition. Uh, and that's the tension, right? And so how does this, how do we account for this, right? And that's kind of what I want to talk about here um, next, right? And to do it, basically, uh, we need a like mini crash course in Catholic ethics, uh, which I'm really running out of time uh, to provide at the moment. Uh, so I will try to keep this as brief as I can. Right? But I would argue um, that you could really boil down Catholic ethics to the foundational of affirming the dignity of the human person, right? That uh, we believe men and women are created in God's image, and as a result, they have uh, a value and a dignity uh, just by being a human person that must be respected. Uh, and pretty much all of Catholic ethics flows from that conviction, right? And so that very obviously leads to the idea that we ought not to intentionally harm human persons, right? Because they have this value, they have this, this dignity. And it seems like, okay, now we can just move from that to no capital punishment, right? But obviously, it's a little more complicated than that, right? There is the Ten Commandments which says, thou shalt not kill, although I think you could quibble and say the translation could a little more accurately be, thou shalt not murder. Um, and then immediately after that, we get, as I said before, the death penalty in the scripture. So it's not quite so easy as human value means no killing whatsoever. All right, so where do we go from? Well, the most obvious case of uh, Catholic ethics allowing for the use of force or even lethal force is in self-defense, right? So the church has taught more or less constantly since um, its beginning that there is a right to, to defend oneself. So if somebody is um, trying to attack my innocent human life, I can use force to stop them, uh, even if that force might be to the extent that uh, I would seriously injure or even kill them uh, in the process. Now, am I violating that basic principle? Uh, and here, uh, again, we have to do a lot more to flesh this out, but I would basically say no, right? That in that situation, my use of force, my intention is not the harm or death of the other person. My intention is the preservation of my own life. Uh, the harm to the other person is an unintended consequence of the action to preserve my own so, uh, therefore, I'm not intentionally harming uh, another person in the way that basic Catholic ethics uh, would say we can't do that. Um, now, by extension, uh, most ethicists have argued we can defend not only ourselves, but we can also defend others, like our family or friends. Uh, and then, furthermore, we can extend it to say the state can defend its citizens against attacks uh, by the use of Right? And so there we have what has historically been the primary justification for capital punishment, namely that uh, in pre modern societies, uh, the only way to humanely and effectively deal with very violent criminals uh, was, in fact, to put them to death. Right? That there simply was not the possibility of humanely and safely housing <coughs> violent people for long, long periods of time. Um, now, there's another aspect of that as well that also supports capital punishment in the tradition. It's not just an issue of self-defense. If you look at the material, uh, it also says that part of the reason why the church uh, affirmed the use of capital punishment was that it was seen as a way of actually affirming the value of human life, and affirming human dignity, right? And again, this is a long, complicated thing, but the basic argument goes something to the effect of human life is so sacred, that dignity is so great, that when someone purposely and uh, evilly uh, violates another person and takes their life, that that sort of an act actually strips a person of their own dignity. Um, and that uh, the demands of justice are such that that person then uh, be put to death for doing such a heinous crime, 
so those two things together were the primary arguments in the Catholic tradition for the death penalty, uh, protecting the innocent uh, and affirming the value and dignity of human life. All right, so then, wow, it seems like I've gone astray from explaining why the Pope's opposed death penalty, haven't I? Um, but I, I, I hope not, right? And basically what I would say is that same reasoning or that same form of reasoning, those same principles in our modern context lead us to different conclusions, right? And that's basically uh, what the recent popes and bishops have argued. Um, now again, there's a lot more here that I, I won't be able to get into, so maybe some of that will come up uh, in questions. But in essence, uh, when we use capital punishment, what we're doing is aiming for a particular good, defense of the innocent or the preservation of human dignity or the affirmation. Uh, and basically, the argument of modern popes and theologians is that in our current context, capital punishment doesn't get us those goods. Or there are ways to get those goods that have less negative consequences for society as a well, whole. Right? So let me say briefly um, kind of more specific reasoning behind it. Um, and one of the things I'm sure that many of you have heard before, if you follow this issue at all, and John Paul II especially talks about this uh, in Evangelium. Right, it's the development of modern penal systems. Right, that in modern uh, societies, we do have the means to effectively protect society from violent criminals, uh, and in a way that is still humane to the people who are being incarcerated. Now, I know we get a whole series of panels on the problems with the American prison system, um, but at least it's in theory possible for us to do that if we as a society really set ourselves to the task. Um, so, uh, again, for example, if somebody attacks me, I can use force to stop them. But if I can stop them with a stun gun instead of a shotgun, I ought to use the stun gun, right? And so if we as a protect society from a person by incarcerating them as opposed to killing them, we ought to choose the means that is less harmful to them and does less evil as an unintended consequence. So uh, if we protect society with imprisonment, we should do that and not execute mm -hmm. for that reason. Um, now again, uh, one could still argue, and many people do argue, well look, capital punishment still has other values in terms of deterrence or in terms of preserving this dignity and value of human life. And again, there's a lot of arguments that we could go into there. Um, but again, I would say uh, the reasoning of the recent popes and bishops is that um, either we don't get those goods from capital punishment or they produce uh, more harm than good uh, the way capital punishment society today. Uh, and again, in terms of the, the harms, I mean, we, we'll probably hear more about this from the other panels. Obviously, there's the issue of innocent people being convicted and almost certainly having been put to death in our country. Um, and we all have heard the dramatic cases um, and Jamie talked about speakers on our campus um, that that's true of. So that's a major negative effect of capital punishment, to put it mildly, that needs to be factored into thinking about whether or not we should do this. Uh, but there are many others. Uh, as Senator McGinn will no doubt talk about, there's the great expense uh, of capital punishment to a society uh, and all the other goods that that money and time and other resources could be put towards in helping people uh, is something important. Uh, there are all, all kinds of issues in terms of uh, bias in the use of the death penalty, uh, racial bias, uh, socioeconomic bias. And again, those biases feed into a lots of negative things in our society, um, which outweigh, uh, most theologians would argue, uh, the benefits, if any, that we might get from, from capital punishment. Uh, and then my time grows short, but I want to especially address this point, too, of, um, of well, look, there's this just justice that's called for, and that capital punishment actually affirms the dignity of human life. Um, and actually, you know, another pretty conservative theologian I was reading on this, Cardinal Dulles, um, addresses this specifically and says, he says there is some truth to that in tradition, but he argues quite convincingly, I think, that in our society, um, there does seem to be a greater uh, contribution to vindictiveness and a devaluing of human life through the use of, the cap of capital punishment. So that instead of actually promoting human dignity, at least in our culture, in our society, um, the use of capital punishment has the opposite effect. It leads people 
value human life less and feeds a sense of, of vengeance. Um, so, to sum up as quickly as I can here, um, I for one would say I see real tension uh, on this issue. Uh, but, having said that, I think if we really take Catholic ethical principles seriously and take the teaching of, of the church seriously, um, we should still reach the conclusion that capital punishment ought not to be used in our society today. Um, that we can get whatever goods capital punishment traditionally provided through other means, uh, like uh, imprisonment. Uh, and in our own society, um, capital punishment produces lots of negative consequences that outweigh any benefits. Um, and now, again, I'm at my limit, but I would just say, uh, for many of you I know feel very passionate And coming from a, a more conservative background, a more skeptical background, uh, I would just argue that it's helpful, I think, to acknowledge that there's a tension in many Christians' minds when it comes to this issue, uh, and that they see this in tradition, they see this in scripture, and to acknowledge that and say, you know, we affirm the principles that uh, were used in the church and in the scripture, but we think if you use those principles carefully today, you will see, as the Pope have seen, that it actually should lead us to the other conclusion now, that we ought not to use uh, the death penalty in modern societies. Um, and I think if we can approach it, maybe it takes a little longer to have that discussion than, than something quick and easy like, well, all Catholics must oppose the death penalty. But I think if we take the time and have that discussion, uh, we can maybe convince some, some Catholics and other Christians who are really committed to these principles who, if they took the time to look at it, might be convinced that those same principles Uh, 
So in 1976, they, you know, a few years later, they think, well, it's fixed now. So the Supreme Court says you can begin to, you know, kill folks again or execute people again in prison. So states then begin to find more humane ways to execute people, and it's kind of an oxymoron or something, a paradox or something. You know, more humane ways to execute people. So the majority of the states now use a procedure called a lethal injection. Uh, where penal barbital uh, initially was used to put the individual to sleep first and then the poison would be injected and then with a matter of minutes uh, the individual was, would be expected to expire. And here of recent, if you follow the news, there have been some issues with that as well and several executions have been uh, stayed uh, until they figure out, you know, what is a better way now. We know we're having problems killing these inmates using penal barbital, so now what do we do? So it seems like it just never ends. It's a cycle here on how to execute the most effective and humane manner. Um, so if we look at Kansas in 1994, we took a few years you know, to get our act together. We came back in 94, and the death penalty went before the legislature and was passed, and got to the governor's desk. It was Governor uh, Joan Finney at the time who allowed the bill really to go on through without a signature. So basically it passed uh, for Kansas and went into law in July 1st of 1994. So we've had on the books, and we have currently right now, there are nine uh, persons on Kansas death row. Uh, six of those are white males, and three of those are African American males. Uh, a couple of their dates are getting very close, but with that said, we also have appeals that are getting, are getting very close. Uh, two of the infamous uh, defendants on death row, Jonathan and Reginald Carr, uh, murder happened maybe 10 years ago, now we're pushing 10 years. Uh, their appeal is just about ready to go. So that's probably going to be in the news a lot here in the next six months uh, to a year. Um, then when we look across the country, about 32 states you know, actively have capital punishment on the books now. Uh, you know, if you look at the numbers, it's over 3,000 inmates, about 3,108 are actually uh, in the United States prison system sitting on death row. And that ranges from one inmate on death row in New Hampshire, one inmate on death row in Wyoming, uh, to the top, which would be California, and they currently house 731 inmates on death row. Um, and there for a while, Texas was really up uh, towards the top of that list, and here recently they've dropped down to probably six or seven there. And that's followed, well, Texas, 200, they have 298 on death row, followed by Pennsylvania, 198, and then Alabama has 197. Uh, I think if you look at the data, you'll see the trends. Typically, you'll find uh, more persons on death row in your southern states than you would uh, other states. And I think there's some history there as well, and it's some context history that goes context history that goes all the way back uh, to postbellum South and, and even before that with, with slavery in this country. Um, Total execution, since we brought back the death penalty in 1976, we've had 1,363 in the United States. Here recently, we've had 86 just since 2012. Uh, the top five states that have executed here recently have been Texas, have executed 509 in the last few years, uh, Virginia, 110, Oklahoma, 109, Florida, 92, and Missouri, 70. Those are kind of the top five, so to speak. Um, let me just say something about deterrence, and there's really not a lot to say about deterrence other than I can tell you that the death penalty is not a deterrence. Uh, trust me on this one, criminologists have looked at this uh, for many, many years. Uh, many criminologists don't even study it anymore because it's been studied out, okay? Um, there are some studies that have some mixed results that show some, you know, maybe it is a deterrence, but they're, they're very rare. And uh, the two that I know of have been attacked uh, through the literature on the basis of methodological arguments. Um, with that said, the studies that have been done, most of them have been very methodologically sound uh, studies where they have used some very sophisticated uh, statistical tools. We're talking about you know, some uh, statistical models with multiple regression, and they've been able to make some very robust uh, or show some very robust outcomes as far as capital punishment, the outcome being that it's really not a deterrence. Many researchers have found that it actually has increased homicides in neighboring communities when a death, uh, when an, ex an execution is carried out. 
there was a colleague uh, several years ago, I say several, probably 15 years ago, down at the University of Oklahoma that was doing some work with capital punishment, looking at um, basically the effect that it would have on other states and other counties with homicide rates. And he found that every time there was a homicide or a, 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 an execution in the state of Oklahoma, homicides would go up in the neighboring areas. So that's about as far as he got, but he did have some pretty good statistical evidence to show that. Uh, so other studies have actually found that same thing in some of the deep southern states as well. So interesting phenomenon. Uh, if you look across, an easy way to do this, you know, if you don't want to, you know, if you don't know how to read statistics and do all these multivariate types of uh, things that we, we do a lot of, um, you know, just look at the states that have capital punishment and look at their murder rates. They are proportionate per 100,000 citizens or much, much higher than the states that don't have capital punishment. That's a pretty simplistic way to look at it. Uh, you can look at Texas, you can look at uh, California, you can look at uh, Alabama, all of these southern states that, you know, have had capital punishment on the books for some time, it hasn't really dropped their homicide rates. They are actually proportionate per 100,000. That's the way the FBI measures that. You know, a citizen per 100,000 population, they're much, much higher than states that don't have capital punishment on the books. So, uh, you know, I could argue that let's say that there's some study that comes out next week and they say, boy, you know, we finally have the most robust study. Uh, it's a 20-year longitudinal study where we know now that the death penalty uh, is a deterrence. And we are going to predict that the more we execute, the more murder rates will come down. It's a significant deterrence. Well, if that come about, and I don't think it will, I just don't think it will, if that came about, my argument would be, okay, well, let me argue this then. What do you think about life imprisonment or the hard 50 without the possibility of parole? Do you think that would be just as an effective punishment as opposed to execution? And by the way, it would be much, much cheaper to do a life in prison without the possibility of parole as well. We know that. I mean, economic, uh, economists have looked at those numbers and uh, Kansas uh, back in 93 did a post audit of our system and it's much, much cheaper to put somebody in prison for the rest of their lives uh, as it would be to execute that individual. So deterrence just isn't something that is fleshed out in uh, a lot of research that's been done over the course of the years. Let me say just real briefly on race, and I can talk on this subject a little bit. I'll touch on a few things. Uh, you know, there's always some hypothesis there that, you know, race was intricately connected with death penalty, that more African Americans uh, were being put to death uh, than white Americans. And we know if you look back in the 1920s and 30s in this country, that was the case. Even into the 1950s, if you look at some of the data, who was executed, it primarily fell on African Americans for such things as raping a white woman. Uh, in some cases, for stealing from white folks, they would be lynched for that. Now, these are only documented cases that we can look at because we know at that time there are a lot of undocumented lynchings that occurred in the society that just aren't there. We don't have the data to really explore. But probably in the um, this was 1983, there was a big uh, statistician, researcher out at the University of Iowa by the name of David Baltus. Some of you have probably looked at his work. He published this study in 1983, and uh, really what he was looking at was about uh, 2,000 capital cases in the state of Georgia uh, that went back, I believe, about 20 years. And what he was interested in to see if we did have this disparity, if this disparity existed, uh, with, among African American defendants who were charged with capital crimes. And guess what? He found in the study that he didn't necessarily find that more African Americans were being sentenced to death as uh, compared with Caucasians, but what he did find was serious disparities in the victims of the crime. So in other words, if an African American had killed a white victim, they were, I mean, it was 22 to 11 times more likely to get the death penalty as opposed to if a white person would have killed a black victim. Those disparities bore out. I mean, it was a significant study. Uh, it was robust. It did everything right. It controlled for a lot of things in, uh, in the analysis. Well, this actual study was one uh, that actually was attached to a case called um, McCleskey versus Kent. 
and it was a death penalty case that uh, was heard by the Supreme Court in 1987, and McCleskey had been sentenced to death. He was an African-American gentleman who was uh, uh, with two other African-Americans. They went into a Dixie Furniture store in Atlanta, Georgia, robbed the place. A police officer uh, responded to the alarm, and we walked in, McCleskey uh, shot the police officer twice, killing him. Okay. Later at the trial, uh, McCleskey testified, and uh, part of the problem, we had a jailhouse snitch that turned and said that he overheard McCleskey one night in the cell talking about the fact that he had killed this police officer during the robbery and uh, allegedly made another statement that if there would have been more police officers coming in, they would have met the same fate in essence. So we have a jailhouse snitch who, by the way, and uh, this was never brought out in court, but who, by the way, was offered to get out of prison, time reduced, if he testified against this individual, which he did. And uh, so they attached this statistical study that Baldus had done. They went to the Supreme Court based on the argument that the, that the death penalty is discriminatory by its very nature because of the fact that if a black uh, individual, a black citizen, kills a white victim, the victim is white, they're more likely going to get the death penalty. The Supreme Court didn't buy it. The vote was four to five, and uh, if you read in this case a little bit more, the deck was stacked uh, before, the, before the attorneys even got into the Supreme Court to make the argument. Uh, there were certain justices that had already begun sending notes back and forth that, you know, we can't let this case happen. We just can't let it happen. Uh, by the way, if you're interested in really reading a, a great, great piece of work, a book that just recently came out, it's uh, Murder in the Supreme Court, and the authors take you through um, well, I think there are six or seven capital cases in the years, and it's a great insight into the Supreme Court workings, how they made their decisions, and the politics that go on among the Supreme Court justice, justices. And normally, that's the conservatives versus the liberal, basically. And that's what we saw in McCleskey's case. It was a four to five decision. Interestingly enough, the justice, I'm trying to think of his name, was it uh, Blackman or White? One of those actually had been one of the instigators that was pushing, you know, we can't let this happen. This guy's guilty, let him, you know, be executed. Well, after he retired off the Supreme Court some years later, uh, his biographer was interviewing him and he said, you know, do you ever think back of some of the decisions you made on the Supreme Court? And if you made decisions, would you do anything different? He said, yes. He said, what would that be? He said, I would have never voted for one death penalty case. So he had changed over the course of the years. Now, Changed too late, but nevertheless, his you know his decision had changed, uh, possibly over something that he saw or learned after he made his decision to stay in execution or let the execution go. Uh, right now, if you look, and this is this is startling too when you look at race uh, execution since 1976, 35 percent of all executions have been African Americans. That's the number, the raw number, 467. Uh, Caucasians 56%, 765, and then we have Latino, which would be 107 or 7%. So if you look at that, Latino, African American, 42% uh, since 1976 have been executed, uh, compared to 56% of Caucasians. Uh, this is another startling uh, piece of data, and this is pretty new here. I just pulled this out a few weeks ago. Uh, of the currently, we have 3,180 on death rows across the country. Um, African Americans represent 42% of those on death row. Latinos represent 13%. Caucasians represent 43%. And other category, which takes in all other race and ethnicity, Asian, et cetera, represents about just over 2%. So again, if you look at this, 54% of our nation's death row are minorities. 54% African American. Latino. Now think about this for a moment. Think about this. What's the population of African Americans in the United States? The latest census has it just about 12%, maybe a little bit over. 12%, but yet we have 42% of African Americans in the prison system that are confined. And I'll give you another piece of data. If you look at the entire prison system in and of itself, if you just look at inmates that may be serving time for drug offenses or robbery or burglary or something to that effect, they represent, just African Americans represent 40% of the United States prison population. Now, I submit to you that 
whenever we have numbers like that, whenever we have disparities, and when we have a group that only represents about 12% of the population, that's a red flag. And that's an area that we really ought to be looking at a little bit more than we have been. And I submit that if you have a system like this, even though inherently there may be no intent for racism to occur here, it's fundamentally racism just by looking at these numbers. And it's, it should be a call uh, to action. Experience I had a couple of years ago as I was doing some uh, jail overcrowding evaluation research for Sedgwick County. And so I asked the sheriff at the time if, you know, if I could come down and, and do a tour of the detention facility uh, just to kind of put it in context what, what I'm dealing with here. And so he said, sure, come on down. And, you know, this thing is huge. It goes about two or three blocks, stretches out, or, you know, just goes down. So, you know, you get tired walking this thing. It's three blocks. And so, he walks me through and he takes me through some of the pods and you'll keep in mind, you know, you walk into these pods, you know, the inmates are just walking out amongst you and they're looking at me and they didn't quite know who I was. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to stick around and have a chat at that particular time. So I was just interested in just learning a little bit more as I was, you know, taking on this research project. But, you know, I came out of there and did some reflection. The thing that struck me, the thing that struck me was the amount of African-American males that was in that jail. It was sickening. It really was sickening. Uh, they looked like they had rough lives. They looked like they were just had been beaten down. And you know, I think we we we've got to. Our system has to do a better job. And uh, you know, there there are factors that are you know factors in brain in society that prevent certain groups from succeeding. And we can stand. We can have debates on that. But you know what happens? I see it in the criminal justice system. I see outcome data where I look at defendants uh, go up before the courts and uh, the outcome comes out and we have a chance to look at outcomes. And I can tell you that when we control for factors such as social class, we control for the type of crime they were before the judge, uh, in many cases we see the young African American male being sentenced more harshly than we do the Caucasian males. That's happened in this area as well. So not only here, we see that across the that particularly is the case, believe it or not, in many juvenile institutions across the country is where we actually look at those outcomes and can see that. So, you know, is there a problem with race? I submit yes, and we probably ought to do more investigations on this and bring it to the, to the forefront more than we, we certainly do. But with that, let me just uh, kind of uh, walk you through three main areas, I think, that are germane to or evolving arguments for the abolition of capital punishment in the United States. I really think it centers on three things, and that's kind of the momentum that we've seen the last few years, particularly here in Kansas. Uh, number one would be declining support for the death penalty. If you looked at some of the recent Gallup polls that have been done, and let's, let's face it, Gallup does a pretty good job. They're just not, they don't go out and just do accidental sampling and you know, get bad data. They do a pretty good job of sampling. Uh, just in 2011, um, we found a drop in support across the country for the death penalty. It's down to about 48%. That dropped from 2009 when it was 53%. So we're seeing the citizens begin to rethink the death penalty. Um, in 2011, a uh, Gallup poll also reported that 48% of Americans would support life imprisonment over the death penalty. And that seems to be the issue that hangs up a lot of citizens is the fact that they still think that when some, if we put someone in prison, that they're going to get out in 10 or 15 years. Let's face it, with the hard 40s and the hard 50s, if you sentence an inmate to a hard 50 and they go into the system, the chances are they're going to die in the system because, as you know, an inmate in, in an incarcerated environment, their likelihood, longevity is much, much shorter uh, as opposed to if he was on the outside. Uh, so probably they're not going to make it out of prison. And certainly if they're given life uh, without you know, they're in prison for the rest of their lives. So I see the declining public support as a big motivator here. Secondly, I see false convictions, and we know that happens. They happen every single year now. We hear of more cases, more persons have been exonerated due to bad testimony, due to DNA evidence that was tampered with, or due to government corruption, DA corruption. We found that in a lot of cases. Um, since 1973, to put some perspective on that, there have been 143 exonerations in this country. And uh, most of those have come to the hands of the Innocence Project and 
fabulous job taking on cases for, for indigent defendants. And keep in mind, we can talk about the class issues as well, because most of the folks uh, on death row, in fact, most of the folks in general in our prison system are poor, and they didn't have anything going into the system. And we created this cycle because uh, throughout the 80s and into the 90s, we had a war on drugs going on in this country, and the war on drugs has just had a disastrous effect on many communities, particularly the African-American community, and particularly the African-American family. When you're sticking away folks uh, for you know, 60 months or 120 months for a small handful of crack cocaine versus sticking away a Caucasian person with a half a pound of powder cocaine for only about six months. I mean, there's a heck of a lot of difference there. So again, you think racism doesn't inherently fall into the system. Well, you know, sentencing guidelines came into, the, came into effect back in the early 90s because it was, in theory, we were going to equal things up. We were going to make it fair. We were going to take a little bit more discretion away from the judges. But what do they do with the sentencing guidelines? They put these minimum, minimum, minimum mandatory sentences for drug debt convictions. So for example, five grams of crack cocaine in the early 90s would get a defendant 60 months minimum mandatory in a federal prison. And if it happened to be within, what was it, 100, uh, 100 feet or maybe 200 feet from a school, it was another 60 months minimum mandatory. So look at it that way. I mean, you would be doing, you know, 12 years in, or I'm sorry, 10 years in a federal prison. And so, you know, the effects on many African American communities, which, by the way, if you look at look at the data, that's where cocaine, the crack cocaine epidemic, really was was centered. It was in poor minority communities, and then powdered cocaine was more in the rich white type of area. So there were disparities. Where was the war on drug fought? in African-American poor minority neighborhoods. So big problem. So false conviction, there's another, another area here I think that's pushing this drive. We know that there have been persons have been executed innocent. We know they've been innocent. Uh, we know we probably have persons on death row right now that are actually innocent. Uh, and we know in the past, what, 30 years, we've had 143 that have been released that have been innocent. We had a guy on campus a couple of years back at Wichita State, uh, Juan Melendez, who spent uh, 18 years in a Florida prison uh, on death row for a crime that he didn't commit. And in his case, the DA had the evidence and didn't reveal it. I don't know, make the DA look bad, but that's part of the corruption that goes on in the system. It does happen. There were several other cases in Louisiana that had the same results where they found corruption in the system. Okay, and the last thing before I sit down, uh, I think that uh, Senator McGinn will probably touch on this a little bit, the economic cost. I think that's an argument now that is uh, the momentum of the beginning to build, that it's expensive. The death penalty is expensive. Um, some of the, some, you know, just to give you some idea here, the death penalty, a death penalty arrest and execution, anywhere from $1.7 million to $3 million per case. Okay, that's a lot of money. Life imprisonment, with the trial included, anywhere from a half a million to 750,000 life in prison. So you see, you put someone away, you're saving a lot of money. And the other part of this, oftentimes we'll hear all of these appeals and they go up and maybe, maybe we've spent, the system has spent uh, $1.3 million already and then all of a sudden the court says, no, we're not gonna execute this defendant. So we just blown all that money for nothing and they go to prison for the rest of their life. So there's a problem there. It's, it's very costly, very expensive. So with that, that's uh, my, what, 10 or 15 minute lesson coming from a room and all this.
guess I just want to share, you know, it's, it's, this issue is, is not an easy one to talk about. And um, certainly I have not been driven by cost because, you know, it, it's how do you, how do you put a cost to anybody's human life? And, um, you know, whether they get the death penalty or not, a murder is taking somebody's life about their will, and uh, some crimes are worse than others, and some are more in the paper, in the TV, and the papers than others. But every one of them, uh, you've impacted somebody's personal life, you've taken somebody's life, and you've uh, messed with uh, the hearts and minds of those left behind. So, uh, it's, again, it's, it, this is just not an easy issue, and, and I would never want walk in and choose the, the family members that are left behind and um, I, I just can't even imagine the things that they deal with. But at the same time, uh, this is something that we should talk about from time to time because it is about life and it's about government taking life. And we should at least have that discussion about how government puts laws on books to take lives and, and what, what areas and criteria they use to take those lives. And so um, I brought this up in 2009 and it started with, because they had the audit, post audit report in 2003 and so money was starting to get tight and we were cutting prevention programs and mental health programs and one thing after another. And and then I, I look at the, the Board of Indigent Services, and they're the ones that have to provide the uh, dependent uh, with an attorney, and, and they didn't have any money, and so, you know, I thought, well, you know, we have life without parole in Kansas now, and that didn't come until later. It came around, I think it was 04, 05, I'm not sure. And it was interesting, I, a former uh, senator shared with me that before we got the death penalty, they would debate life without parole, and it would be long hours and into the evening, these battles. And after we got the death penalty on the book, somebody just brought it up around what I've ever, oh, at some point in time, somebody commits a crime, and they were a child of God, but now they're not. And somewhere along the path, I, I couldn't figure out where they all of a sudden or removed from that status. And, you know, I look at some of these folks, and again, going back to prevention, I think about um, children, or even before they're born, maybe the mother was pregnant and she was kicked. Or after the child was born, the child was thrown around um, in some kind of abuse. Or maybe when they were six years old, they watched their mother be raped. You know, I don't know what happens to these folks along the way, but something happened. And, and so, again, you know, and you, can't be, you can't excuse them. You know, everybody has to be responsible for their actions. Um, but at the same time, when we have a government that decides that we will take that life, and it's because of X, and in our country, it's generally it's heinous, horrible murders. In other countries, it could be um, other crimes. So um, that's why I believe that we should at least have the discussion, and uh, and, it, and and it may not go anywhere, but we should not just take this death penalty, put it on the shelf, and never talk about it again. Because as we shared, we we've, we've abolished the death penalty a few times in Kansas. And now it's back. Um, so the Judicial Council uh, was charged with doing a study, and, and Michael talked about the, the numbers. Um, and in the 2003 audit, it was about 70% cost more. Um, when the, the Judicial Council's report is not finished yet, but they came out with it's about 70% higher. The reason it's higher. You have to run two cases. You have to run a non-death penalty case and a death penalty case. Uh, your your uh, lawyers have to 
have go through training, your jury has to go through training, your judges have to go through training. So there's just a lot more that they have to do um, in that situation. So um, anyway, let me just go and, and uh, change just a little bit and talk a little bit about what's happening uh, in Topeka. Um, the bill that was introduced in 09 uh, pretty much just got a discussion, no vote came back in 10, had a vote. It went 2020 in the Senate. Um, we had changes in elections, and so um, the Kansas Coalition and the death penalty, it was kind of decided that, you know, we've, we've already had the discussion in the Senate. You need to go talk to the folks in the House, see where they're at. They still have not had a hearing. I'm not sure Representative Becker's going to have one. Uh, he's, he's asked for one. But we just don't know where the House is at as far as, as this topic, and they haven't had the uh, discussion. But it's a difficult one to have. There's a lot of emotion. We had hearings last week on this. And, you know, there's compelling testimony about why we should get rid of the death penalty. But then when we have the opponents, there's a lot of emotion, and even one of the senators uh, lost his daughter to a horrible murder, and, uh, and he had a few things to say about that. And uh, he, he's hurt, and, and his wife is too. And so again, it's when we want to go to talk about other things such as, um, you know, if you talk about cost, some people think, oh, you're just saying it's about money. No. If you talk about um, some of the statistics that Michael shared about, um, other states that have the death penalty, there's more crime. Well, are we more homicides? Well, why is that? Is it because we have a death, and so to take care of that, we have to take have another death. Um, you know, so uh, it's just again, it's it's hard to get to that surface or that level of we're talking about human life, um, we're talking about dignity of life, and and especially when you're talking about people that have done uh, horrible things to those who have been murdered. There's another bill. Uh, so that bill, we had testimony, we are working it on Monday. So it's moving quickly. Um, I don't know that it's, you know, it, it may be good motion in second, and, and it may not go anywhere. If, if I had to judge or guess uh, where the rest of the committee is and, and Senate Judiciary, my guess is it's not even going to get out of committee. Um, there's another bill, though, I think you should be aware of that I'd like to just uh, speak to just a little bit. It's 257. And it has to do with shortening the deadlines and restrictions um, of the appeal process. <laughs> and, you know, on the surface, I, I am even one that has said, I don't know why it takes so long to, you know, why should folks have to go through this and then wait, you know, as we shared, 10 years to even come through the first appeal. Your appeals are part of your due process as a citizen. But why does it take so long? Why can't we have speedy trials and speedy appeals? Well, the testimony that we receive is the, the work that they have to do, like two people have to be assigned to the case, and, and they have to question all these other things. So they showed us the massive amount of work that they have to do. So. In, in order to get to that appeal. Well, we're cutting budgets, and so now um, we don't have the individuals to even spend that time to do the appeal. And this bill will also, if it's a non-death penalty case, and one of your family or friends been murdered in a non-death penalty case, it will not have precedent. Death penalty cases will have go first above non-death penalty cases and also the for civil cases and other things. So uh, anyway, I just think it, it's going to end up complicating the, the whole process um, and causing more uh, grief as, as we move forward. But that, so that's 257. That's the one that, that you should follow because I have a feeling it's going to get out of committee and it's probably going to go to the floor for discussion. So, um, again, I'm going to stop because I think it's more important uh, for us to hear what your thoughts and questions are. And um, 
I look forward to um, some of the issues and, and things that you're thinking about. Um, and clearly we'll um, share more detail uh, as you want as far as the legislative process. But it's kind of strange because the first week of session, I hate to say it, not a whole lot happens. And our judicial um, chairman decided he was just going to start and have hearings. And so nobody even had a chance, really. I mean, the Kansas Coalition of Death Penalty, they, they were able to put together a lot of good folks uh, to testify. And, uh, but again, it's that it's happening so quickly. I'm standing here sharing with you about a bill that we've already heard. The session just started and that we're going to be working with Bill on Monday. So with that, um, thank you for inviting me tonight. Before I do that, just a, a couple of things. Um, uh, at the back of the room, there's a table. Uh, the Kansas Coalition Against Death Penalty has some information there. You can get on their mailing list if uh, what you've heard tonight makes you feel like you want to do that. Um, the other thing I want to say is to affirm uh, what our panelists were saying about the death penalty being an extraordinarily difficult issue for a lot of reasons, uh, emotional reasons, um, moral reasons, theological reasons. Uh, Professor Pastor talked about the, the complicated history of the issue in Catholic teaching. Um, and so I, in, in affirming that and in recognizing that, I want to create a space for our discussion here in which whatever questions you have, uh, whatever questions are in your heart or in your mind uh, are, are welcome here. We, we want to hear uh, from a variety of viewpoints. We want to hear your questions. We, of course, want to have a discussion that's respectful uh, and mindful of the diversity of viewpoints. But I, I want to invite uh, anyone who feels uh, that they have a question to um, raise your hand or, or, or stand up. I'll, probably, if there's a lot of questions, I'll, I'll recognize it. Please wait to be recognized before you ask. And then, and then address your question to one, or if you want to hear from more than one of the panelists, let us know that. And then uh, the panelists have a microphone. I'm going to have to ask you to share, I think, the microphone. Um, but if you would repeat the question so everyone can hear and, and have, a, have a discussion. Thank you. Who wants to go first? I'll ask you a question. I, I read recently in the, uh, in the Eagle that 38% of inmates have mental illness issues. Um, can you uh, address that with uh, those who are on uh, death row? Is it higher? Is it the same? Is that pretty average? And if there is mental illness, it seems really punitive if we're dealing with people who, who need help and uh, we just disregard the emotional help, the inner mental health uh, that they need. It. And uh, so if you could just address that in some way. Uh, and anybody up there that has information. I'll take a stab at that. I, I gave you the microphone, so you might <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I can tell you, yes, that's absolutely correct. And many of the inmates that come into the facility, they do. They have mental illness issues, and that's a problem. Uh, we've de we deinstitutionalized a lot of our facilities across the state, and when that happened, uh, what, uh, 20 years ago, I guess now, uh, where did they end up? A lot of those ended up in the criminal justice system. I know when I was doing some, some jail evaluation work just a few years ago, one of the things we determined when we begin to go through and look at case files on inmates, many of those inmates had serious mental illness issues. And uh, the problem uh, when they're in a jail setting is they're not being addressed, uh, you know, as effectively as they could. They don't have the resources there. They do what they can, but it's, it's not that effective. So with that said, I would hypothesize based on what I've seen, yes, there are serious issues with mental illness. I just want to add to that, though. So what happens when they do go to jail, again, they don't respond. You know, like if, if somebody just in their normal mind, I guess, you know, they tell them to do something. They just don't respond to that um, kind of order. And then when they get out, they, they have lost their, their Medicaid or whatever that may have provided them with some prescriptions that kept them stable. They get out and it takes like five days to get through the system again in order to get back on track. 
and by that time they just start cycling back through the, the gel again. Another issue related to this is children being tried as adults and when you look at brain development that's not fully complete until 25 years of age. I guess justifying, like I said, children being tried as adults and sometimes then the death penalty applies to uh, people at such a very young age. How would you address that issue? Well, the question is how to address uh, children being tried as adults and potentially being sentenced to death. Yeah, that, we see that a lot in the, in the juvenile facility where you know, juveniles are adjudicated into the adult court. Most of the times, the cases here anyway, they haven't got to the extent to where there's a capital punishment case. And I believe uh, the way the Kansas law is written that we wouldn't be able to execute under the age of 18 here in our state. And I'm not sure how other states, their statutes are written, but in Kansas, it has, they have to be 18 years of age. But there have been some in other states. Florida, I believe. Yeah, right. right. Florida is one of those states, yes. And uh, I believe Georgia for some time. You both referenced the deterrence. This is a halfway humorous story. When England had pickpocketing as a capital offense, they would have the execution out there in the public. And you know what the pickpockets were doing? The crowd would gather and in pockets. Question though, in terms of the uh, surveys, what is it in Kansas in terms of for or against the death penalty? Do you know that? You know, KDACP did a survey a few years ago, and I don't have that data here. Do, do you know, Jennifer? As I recall, it was about a 60 40 split. With You know, when you get to that question, you know, you're insinuating where they profile because of their color and put into the system. I, I don't think we can make that assumption up front. Uh, we know that happens in many cases. I think what we have to look at from a research standpoint are outcomes uh, from the court system. And then we look at similar uh, cases that happened uh, utilizing the same variables that we can control for and then seeing who ends up in prison and who doesn't. So what I'm saying is that there are outcome data that we have access to that we can look at that show or that indicate that, you know, an African American for the same crime with the same criminal history is up before the court versus a Caucasian for a similar crime um, and the same criminal history, but the African American is going to prison. So that that is the argument here. Um, given the numbers you gave us on uh, decline in support for the death penalty, um, and I'm sorry this is so obscure, but given the uh, rise in access to information and uh, uh, I, I would just say corruption at all governmental levels across the board, is there any indication that that had any effect on the outcome of those results or distrust of, of the government? I, I think so. I think, you know, anytime citizens get more information about some phenomenon, uh, I think they're better able to make a more informed decision about it, the way they feel about that phenomenon. Um, you know, I can tell you that the Innocence Project has done a significant job, you know, getting information out to the general public and, you know, go to their website sometime. I mean, it, it's loaded with information on these cases that have been exonerated. And, it, you know, they, you can click and walk through the entire system and thinking, my goodness, you know, how did this happen? But, you know, in the end, many of those cases, it, it was prosecutorial misconduct uh, that was allowed to go. And, uh, you know, prosecutors had had evidence that they didn't release. That was the, that was the case in the Juan Melendez 
uh, situation in Florida where he spent 18 years. The prosecutor had the evidence that could have been introduced that probably would have got him acquitted at trial, but he did not present that evidence. So those are the problems oftentimes you see. about gender bias there is a bias against males uh, you know females represent uh, you know statistically less than what two one or two percent on death row so, yeah. and I think that goes back to the history of the American correction system uh, female offenders have always been historically treated different than, than male offenders and it goes back to the cottage system years ago that we had in this country to where you know females were brought in and the idea was to rehabilitate females give them a home environment and you know, rehabilitate them and release them back into society. Males, you know, weren't set up that way. They went to a nasty place. My name's Mike Coach. I'm a Mississippi uh, pastor, retired in Extra Price. Um, I'm a member of the board of the school of change. So, uh, again, I want to thank you, first of all, for all the work you've done. is uh, I believe that Senate Bill 257 is a disaster. Um, I think it preempts due process. It potentially could put a much more uh, serious financial vice upon those who are fighting, uh, fighting for their defense because they don't have the resources in the first place than if uh, they're forced to present evidence within six months, and a decision in three years, uh, I don't know how people would come up with more and uh, more expensive resources. Um, so I really hope that you will continue to oppose 247. And I really hope that 126 is not going to get lost in the trash. But I, I would also like to ask your opinion on what you think of 257, uh, and maybe give us a little bit more Well, um, first off, I, I want to share one of the individuals that testified um, on 257. His name was Ray Crone, and he was convicted of murder in Arizona. And he spent 10 years in jail. And it was interesting to hear his story because somebody, they said that there was a bite mark and it was his teeth. Later, they were able to use DNA but he had to fight to get somebody to even help him or to even listen um, through that whole process. Um, but, I uh, forgot where I was going here with this, but he, uh, anyway, he eventually he was, he was able to get out. But he's, one of the things I thought was interesting was when they had the final trial and just pretty much some of the things that Michael talked about in the other um, case, um, that he, he um, sorry, it's been a long day. <laughs> I, I did just drive in from Topeka. Uh, but uh, he, he, he was given the chance to give his remorse at the end, and he didn't have remorse. And that's part of why the judge just threw the book at him. And he said he didn't have remorse because he didn't do it. And uh, I just thought his story was, was very interesting. But anyway, he came in to testify on, on the Senate Bill 257. Um, you know, I, our legislature is uh, certainly different. And, and I'll just share, um, and it's an election year for the House. Um, but it seems like I, that camera makes me nervous. I don't know if I'm going to be on TV one of these days. <laughs> so, you know, I, and I'm a Republican, but it seems like sometimes when we get into these campaigns, people want to be tough on crime. And so this is a perfect thing, this 257, to say we're going to be tough on crime. And again, I said on the surface, 
it makes sense. It's like, why do families have to wait for this appeal process to, to go through? But it is our due process. So I think about this Ray Crone who was wrongfully convicted. And had they sped it up, he'd have probably been executed before he even had a chance to prove that he was innocent. Um, so there's going to be a lot of interesting uh, arguments, and I'd say I, whoever can pay attention on Monday when we work the bill, but I, my guess is if I, it's going to go through. So I don't know who you're, if you're, you think this is, um, you know, something that's going to be uh, very uh, detrimental to our system, then I would suggest that you talk to whoever your senator is especially if it gets out of committee, it'll be on the floor. And uh, your phone calls do make a difference. So I'm not giving you specific details, and if I you know, was a lawyer and I could get into all the legalese, that they, uh, things that they talked about, um, I would. And I'm gonna learn a lot more on Monday. A lot of times we listen to testimony, and then it's not until we work the bill that we get into all these discussions, and then you'll learn a great deal more. Um, so, um, Anyway, uh, be watchful. I don't think so, no. I'm this, and just a day of session, like Tuesday, didn't even, it wasn't even written. That's how quick it came. And so um, then we received later. So I don't think a lot of people have had a chance to really thoroughly go through the details of that. Could I follow up that? And you mentioned that the, the other bill, the, the one to abolish the death penalty, uh, you thought probably wouldn't even make it out of committee, whereas in 2010 there was a 2020 vote on a, I guess a similar bill. But is that because of the change in makeup of the Senate, or, or what do you think that is? Yeah. <laughs> I would say um, eight of those people were defeated. And it, not just because of the death penalty, certainly, but they were defeated for other things and, and also, in my opinion, um, postcards that didn't really make sense for state politics, but no, it is what it is. So, um, and then probably two have since just retired. And so, uh, yes, our, our chamber has changed significantly. Yeah, so the, the question was um, about, well, what do we say to a friend who says, well, look, in the Bible it says we have an eye for an eye, and, and, and so then doesn't it make sense, right, to, to execute, particularly for cases of murder? Uh, now, obviously, as, as the question, person asking the question said, this wouldn't apply to some things, uh, like rape or other kinds of assaults, but in murder it seems like it maybe would. Um, and, and again, I, I think, I would like for there to be a nice, really quick answer. I, I do think it's something that, that takes some discussion and talking about uh, at some length. I would say, you know, um, if this person is, is Catholic, um, you know, we, we do need to look. As Catholics, we need to also consider uh, what, what the magisterium would say or what the, the bishops and popes would say. And, and if they're saying, you know, something else that ought to be done in the case of the murder, well, then that should give us pause about just picking up the Bible and saying, Oh, well, an eye for an eye. Um, I would even say, you know, within, you know, having studied theology, right, it, again, this is a huge topic of debate, but I think most people would agree, you know, in the context, an eye for an eye wasn't meant to make punishments harsher, right? It was actually an attempt to, to scale things back, right? And that uh, in, in those societies at that time, you'd often get these kind of blood feuds and vengeance kind of going back and forth. And so when an eye for an eye is written in the Bible, the intention is to stop that and to say, all you can do is, is this. All you can do is an equivalent punishment. So it's not saying, it's not in the Bible pushing for harder penalties. It was a way to, to scale it back. And then of course, I think you can see, while there is still, I think, 
capital punishment and kind of through the Bible, um, we can see in a lot of areas that there's a move over time, even within the Bible, to kind of, kind of a better understanding of what God's will is, right? And that uh, we could say um, all kinds of issues like slavery, just because it's in the Bible doesn't necessarily mean that's God's will. And that we can, it doesn't fit with biblical principles. Uh, and I think you could make the same similar argument here. Well, yes, it is in the Bible. But let's, why, why is it there? What are the principles um, behind that statement of an eye for an eye, right? It's meant to limit the damage we do in terms of punishments. And let's take that logic forward to today and say, can we punish people effectively while doing less harm uh, by imprisonment as opposed to capital punishment? Does I have a question in relation to that? expert by any means, but is that quote not from the Old Testament where the New Testament after Jesus came along doesn't it focus more on forgiveness and um, love one another even if they've done something wrong that maybe that kind of supersedes that particular concept? Yeah, um, and again, so the question is, that's an Old Testament idea. What do we do with the New Testament that seems to place much greater emphasis on forgiveness or turn the other cheek uh, and those sorts of ideas? And again, this is a topic of considerable debate. Um, you know, I, I think to be fair, many, many Christians would argue, well, um, yes, there's a development, um, but uh, there are also passages in the New Testament like Romans 13, um, that would still seem to affirm a role for the use of force uh, in enforcing justice. Um, there's also, I think, fair questions to raise about are there different ways we think about this in terms of as an individual how I respond to somebody who has wronged me versus how society or a judicial system will, will treat somebody who's done a crime, right? And so Jesus clearly calls on individual Christians to kind of show forgiveness, um, but through much of the interpretation uh, of church history, uh, a lot of theologians have argued that um, that there still is, while the state ought to be merciful as much as it can, it has also a kind of corresponding requirement to still inflict punishments to, to defend justice. So I, I think there's something to that, I yeah, think. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that, but I'm just... Eye for an eye was also brought up in one of the testimonies of the folks that were uh, opposed to uh, uh, getting rid of the death penalty. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to bring up the, the thought about justice. You know, a lot of times, and this came up in our debate on the floor a few years ago, but, you know, justice needs to happen. And we haven't talked about this much, but you know, some people think justice is, and, and I've had people share this, this is not just Carolyn's view or anything, but some people have said, justice is killing that person because they have killed. Well, to other people, justice is maybe throwing them in prison and making them sit in a cell and think about what they've done the rest of their life. Some people believe that would be more painful. So, you know, we don't really talk about justice, but that is one of the issues that come up. So back to this hard to even get into the discussion, and, and I saw this on the Senate floor, people would get so fired up and, and enraged that you couldn't even get past that. And, and I've shared with folks before that, you know, if, if I watch like some civil rights shows and read John Grisham books and things like that. Some of that stuff just, you know, when, when somebody does someone else wrong, it just it gets me so fired up. You know, so my initial response is, I want to do something because that, that upsets me because you're hurting someone else. But if you act on your emotion, you've just done what, what they did. And so, I understand that emotional side. We all have that, you know. God made us that way. But 
we have to kind of move past that, and that's why it's so hard to talk about this issue because it's hard to get past that anger and that, you know, that welled up emotion inside because somebody did something to somebody else. question was what would happen if uh, the inmates that are currently on death row in Kansas if they overturn the death penalty in Kansas what would happen to those inmates uh, they would re they would have their sentences commuted to life in prison and you know you mentioned if it's over if it's overturned yes if, if it's a, the way the bill is drafted is that if, so BTK, when he committed his crimes, we didn't have um, the death penalty. And that's why he could not get the death penalty. Those, and I believe it's nine on death row, they will still get the death penalty. That's the way the bill is drafted. So it will only change going forward. So. Um, and there's a lot you could discuss about why the bill was drafted that way, but, but that's the way the bill is, is drafted. And BTK did not get the death penalty because we didn't have it on the books when he committed his crimes. And by the way, he sits in a cell 23 hours a day and only gets out for one hour. And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that because I even like him getting out for one hour, but I'm just saying he, he, it's, you know, this came up in discussion too, and I'm sorry to take up your time, but one of the questions that came up was, are other cellmates protected? Well, those on death row, they are in their own wing. Um, but there are other murderers that aren't necessarily in that wing, and so that was one of the questions, was that if somebody on death row was able to kill some other inmate, well, they're not even in the same area, and, and again, they're not out like we watch our movies and people are out in the, you know, the common area and lifting weights and doing all those things, shooting baskets. They do not get that privilege at all. Do you mind if we take one more question? If I could just real quick, just to dovetail on that, I, I guess the only hope then would be if the Supreme Court would, you know, rule it unconstitutional and then that, that could happen, as they did in 70, what, 72, I guess. But I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. The makeup of the court now. Okay. Um, I wonder what, if any, impact that you all think um, the Carr brothers appeal um, will have, kind of coinciding with what's going on in the legislature, especially in light of what you were talking about with the the racial, you know, the victim versus the perpetrator. If you think that will. I think it's going to have an impact. Um, there was a lot of attention because of that, the, the brutalness, the horrible acts that uh, were committed. And the unfortunate thing was that it was on our televisions every day and in the paper every day. And, you know, those families went through a lot, um, but our community did too, to hear about all that. And so, now they're coming up for their appeal. And, you know, it's unfortunate that we have a media that's going to play all that all over again. So a whole other generation gets to go through that as well. So, no, it, it's going to be on people's minds. It, it was such a horrible, horrible, I mean, every murder is horrible, but, but that one in particular, uh, uh, we all got to learn about the brutal details on it. All right, well, let me, uh, one more time, uh, ask you to thank our panelists. Um, it was an interesting discussion tonight. I know that uh, the issue remains complex and um, that there's likely to be still a variety of viewpoints, but I think you've heard, you've had a lot to, uh, a lot of food for thought. 
uh, from tonight's discussion. I thank you for your uh, participation and contributions, but especially I also thank our panelists for taking the time to be with us. Tonight.